put it as far up the Celtic end and amongst all our, our, all our supporters. It took about five minutes to, for the ball to come back. Fans are so important to the team, just like the we, you know, in this European campaign, the fans are vital when it comes to games at Celtic Park. Coming up on the official Celtic FC podcast, we're joined by Celtic legend Roy Aitken as he helps us preview Wednesday night's Champions League clash at home with Atletico Madrid. The ball from Palma was just perfect. How many players can take that ball on the run the way he did and volley it beyond the keeper? And we also look back on Celtic's impressive 4-1 victory over Hearts. This is the official Celtic FC podcast. Hey, hi everyone, welcome along to the official Celtic FC podcast, the only podcast out there for exclusive content from inside the Celtic changing room. I'm your host, Ryan Marr, and today alongside me for this one, I am joined by, first of all, Matt Campbell. Matt, how are we? Very well, thank you. Good weekend and a fantastic result, which I'm sure we're going to get into. Yeah, very much so. Um, fantastic win against Hearts on Brilliant. Sunday, so we're, we're going to get right in amongst that. And also alongside us for this one is our Celtic View editor, Paul Cuddy. Paul, your first appearance on the podcast this season. How, how's things? Well, obviously, I'm not part of the WhatsApp group, so I didn't get the message for the, for the dress code, but i um, delighted to be here, and I'm uh, looking forward to the, yeah, the Celtic good. chat. Well, actually, it's not your first time on the podcast, because you've uh, hosted our post-match show that we're doing now after games at Celtic Park as well, um, yourself and, and Simon Donnelly, but um, yeah, we've got to have lots to get into today. We're going to have the discussion about the game against yes. Hearts um, in the weekend, and also the big preview against Atletico Madrid in the Champions League coming up. But we're going to get straight into it because we have an exclusive interview with Celtic legend Roy Aitken, played more than 600 games for Celtic, and he joined us to look ahead to this big match against Atletico Madrid because he has his own memories, which I'm sure we'll get into as well mm. uh, thereafter. So let's get straight into this interview with Roy Aitken, and when we come back, we're going to look ahead to the match against Atletico Madrid. It's an absolute honour to have this man on the official Celtic FC podcast. He's a former captain of the club, but he's also so much more than that with 667 appearances, 55 goals from 1975 when he made his debut all the way through to 1990. I think six league titles, five Scottish Cups, a League Cup, but there's also so many more moments in there as well. Absolute pleasure and privilege to welcome Roy Aitken onto the podcast. Roy, thank you so much for joining us. How are you? I'm fine, Ryan. Yeah, I've done a bit of homework there. You've got all the details correct. That's good, yes. <laughs> I'm, I'm glad I got them correct. I'm glad there wasn't anything wrong there. You did. Um, no, thank yeah, you. Close so enough, much. anyway. Close enough. <laughs> <laughs> I'm I'm really glad that you've been able to to join us. We're going to have a specific look ahead to this Atletico Madrid match in the Champions League. But first of all, how are you? How's life treating you? I'm all good. I mean, I come back and forward the regular to the games. Um, I, you know, I'm, I'm ambassador of the club, so the club was kind like to ask me to come and be an ambassador. So I come up to the boardroom, enjoy the games, meet some of the boys. You know, it's nice to see the guys from the past as well and get a good chat with them. And I do enjoy it. I live obviously in North Yorkshire at the moment. So um, it's just nice to, to travel back and forward and, and, you know, and watch the team do so well. Yeah, very well deserved for an absolute club legend. Honestly, it's, a, it's an honour to, to speak to you. Um, why don't we get straight into it, Roy? Because we've got plenty to get into. As I said at the start, we're going to look ahead to this Atletico Madrid game for Celtic. And the reason... We've picked yourself as a guest, not just because of your amazing career, but because you played in a very memorable game against Atletico in 1985. But just before that, Roy, the first time you played against Atletico Madrid was that, I think, more infamous than famous game in 1974 in the European Cup semi-final. And you made your debut for Celtic the following year in 1975. I just wondered, did you have any memories of that game at all? Because it kind of lives long in the memory of the football club. Not so much many memories. I mean, I've watched it many times on, on the video and, you know, the, the, they got away with, you know, being very you saw, unprofessional on the night, Madrid, you know, and it, it was it's one of those games where, you know, you look back, the referee could have been stronger on the night, I think, on that game in particular. I know he sent off a few players, but, um, I don't know too much about it. You know, I know obviously the game, the, the the game you mentioned, the eighty-five game was was a great game, was a great spectacle, but disappointing results. But due to a lot of different circumstances yeah. that we'll probably speak about. But the seventy-four game, I don't remember too much about, to be honest. 
Yeah, let's just go into that game then in, in 1985. It was the first round of the old Cup Winners' Cup, but I think before we get to that, the place we probably need to start is in the Cup Winners' Cup the previous season because it was a game against Rapid Vienna, which actually really influenced our next game against Atletico Madrid. Of course, again, another very infamous tie in our history. We go 3-1 down in the first leg. We win the next leg 3-0 at Celtic Park. Um Maybe you could take it from there, actually, Roy, about what your memories are of what then happened after that. Yeah, that was disappointing that, that year because obviously um, Rapid went all the way to the final. Um, I think Everton beat them in the final that year. So we, we had a very good team that year. I mean, the team was strong and we, we scored a lot of goals, created some, you know, a lot of chances, played some very energetic football, you know, under David Hay. And really on the night, you know, we did enough to take it through. You know, the, you know, there was obviously a situation where the uh you know the referee obviously had a problem. There was some objects thrown onto the onto the pitch. The rapid Vienna players made the most of that, and and then we paid the price. We had to pre replay the game down at Old Trafford. Not only replay the game, but replay the game from being three one down in the first leg, which was another you know bit of a a, a body blow for us. And, and obviously we didn't do enough. Uh, it wasn't enough to take us through. So and then on the back of that, obviously we then suffered because it meant our next European game, which was the Atletico game at the start of eighty five season. Um, was going to be up behind closed doors. Um, so not only did we pay for that game, the Rapid Vienna game, but we're also continuing to pay the following season um, where it took us to that closed door game at Celtic Park. You know, and, and I know we got the one each result over in um, Madrid, which was a great performance by the team. I think Big Packy saved a penalty late on in the game. But overall, I think we well-deserved our, our draw there. Um, and again, with a, with a nice team that year, a good good quality side, scoring goals, making chances, strong defensively as well. And we felt as if we had a chance in the second game, obviously, after getting the one-each one each draw in, in Madrid. Yeah, that one-each draw was the, the first leg, as you, you mentioned there. I mean, Atletico Madrid, Madrid in general, Spain in general, is always a tough place to go in Europe. That would have been the old Vicente Calderon that they, they played at at that point in time which was always very well known in Europe for having a really ferocious atmosphere do you remember much about that specific game and going over to Madrid to take on Atletico yeah well I remember the, I remember you know bits of the game I think mean, Paul McGugan came into the, into the game Big Paul and I played at the back Big Paul played centre back one of his first games I think for the club um, I know with, with, with good strikers you know with, with you know McClare and and Johnson and Proven McLeod, you know, Tommy, I think, played left back. Danny was right back. Um, I think it was Paul and maybe Grantie in the middle. I mean, that's I mean, my thinking back to the game, you know what I mean? So we, we had a good side. Um, I mean, that side that year went on to win the league eventually at the end in the famous game at, at St. Mirren. Um, you know, when we beat St. Mirren the five and Hearts, Hearts lost. So it went to the very end. That was a good, it was a good team that year. And unfortunately, again, you know, Rapid Vienna getting to the final. The year before, Atletico, I believe, went all the way to the final. In that second season, I think Dynamo Kiev beat them in the final, if, I, if I'm not mistaken. So we were up against two good sides. And, I, I, you know, that's probably one of the disappointments in a sense of, you know, at Celtic, for me as well, was we didn't, I didn't actually get by the quarterfinal stages of, of European competitions, you know, major European competitions. But those two seasons, we had the potential, I think, to do what Rapid did and get to the final and arguably do what Atletico did and get to the final but we were still suffering in the second game and there's no doubt the lack of atmosphere and the motivation that you get from the fans at Celtic Park paid its price in the in the, in the return leg at Celtic Park because it was such a flat game um, and you know it, it didn't really help us in any way because the fans are so important to the team just like the we you know in this European campaign the fans are vital when it comes to games at Celtic Park Yeah what was it like coming back from Madrid with a really positive result one each you must have been full of confidence going to Celtic Park thinking second leg at home we can get the job done there but then what was it like as a group of players knowing that you were going into the game with no fans and I'm sure I was reading it this morning that the game kicked off at 2pm as well so you didn't even have that nighttime atmosphere either did you? Yeah yeah. it was a it was a, it was a a false atmosphere in the sense, you know, the, the players were still motivated for the game because, you know, we, we knew how important it was and we knew obviously the game was going to be behind closed doors from the start of that season. That was that had been announced by that time we knew that was the case. Um, it, it's just, 
you know, it just you just lose that little bit of edge that can come from the fans, you know, really being behind you and also spurring you on when things maybe are not going so good. You know, that just let that little edge. Look, we saw it during the during the, the pandemic as well at Celtic Park. You know, it's such an important part that the fans play at Celtic Park for the team. You know, and, and especially those European nights back in the day where they are at special nights. Uh, and we've had, you know, it's had some terrific results. I remember we beat Real Madrid, we beat Sporting Lisbon, the Rapid Vienna. We can go to numerous other games at Celtic Park. You know, I'm talking about in my era, but before me and even after, there's been terrific games. But And that's all down to the team doing their part, but also the supporters doing their part. And nobody ever underestimates that. And it's only like occasions like that Atletico Madrid game where you do know or you do realise how important the fans are to, to the team and just giving you that little extra edge. And also, remember, to the opposition who come over. Because, you know, the Atletico came to that game and it you know, ended up like a, a bit of a training match for them as well. Now, they were a, they were a very, very good side. Um, and we would have done terrific to get, get an actual result over there in Madrid. We just needed that wee edge of the fans, you know, whether it's a hostile atmosphere, whether it's a, the fervent support, fervent support, or whatever, that we missed it on the day. And you know, okay, we had chances. You know, if you look back in that game, we had, I think, um, unlike a Murdo, Murdo missed a great chance early doors in the game. I think um, Morris and maybe Brian had a couple of chances as well in, in the match to actually, you know, put us in the lead. Um, but then we lost first goal in the first half, and then lost the second goal. Um, and it was it was an uphill battle after that, albeit we still created a quite a few chances in that match. But we needed the the overall the overall um, impact that a home support gives you, whether it's whether it's to do with the referee, whether it's to do with the opposition, or whether it's to do with yourself as a, as a team. We need that impact, and we didn't have it on that day. Because probably where that's most felt, looking back in the game today, reading the reports of it, as you said, we go two 0 down. But then you pull a goal back to make it 2-1 with, I think, 15 or 20 minutes left in the match. And you imagine on any European night, if that's a situation with 15, 20 minutes ago and Celtic pull a goal back, the crowd are off their feet at that point. And probably as an opposition player, you would probably know better than anybody else. As an opposition player, you probably see people going into their shell. So that's probably where we missed that, didn't we? Well, that's right. It's all those factors. You know, it's the factor of of the, the fans getting really behind you and, and pushing you on and driving you on in those games. It's the fact that the fans on, on nights like that can also influence referees, you know, because they, you know, I've seen it myself in Europe many times in the past where, you know, referees can be influenced heavily by by supporters, you know, claiming for decisions or whatever. And it can also uh, have an impact on the opposition, you know, and you're right, that last 15 minutes would have been, had we been able to get back, you never know what would have happened. But even before that, as I said, prior to that, in the game itself, that was just an eerie. It was an eerie atmosphere. Well, well, we, we did, you know, we did see it again during the COVID, you know, experience. Um, but that was the first time back in those days that that had ever happened, and it was an eerie experience that day. I think that there was a, a call of, of of police around the stadium, so no fans could get anywhere near the stadium. Um, obviously, there was nobody in the stadium apart from some press. Uh, and when you watch any footage of it, it's like you hear the echoing of everything around that stadium. All those, all those factors that you've mentioned, Brian, they were, they were on the, they were on, the, they were on the day. But um, still, a great experience and still something that you learn from it at that time. Yeah, and it's yeah leads us nicely then on to you know the current team that are going to be going into the game against Atletico Madrid. Um, more recently, we played them about 2011 as well in the Europa League, but. Going into a match like that against such a big team, it brings back so many memories from your time, from 1974, from, from 2011 as well. Good history, yeah. Brilliant history, yeah, you're right. And hopefully this team, with that cauldron atmosphere that was missing in your game, can get something against Atletico Madrid. It'd be a brilliant result. Of course, I mean, the home games the home games in the in the Champions League or in any European competitions are so vital. You know, and that's where hopefully Celtic this year can get some victories, you know, at home and gather the points at home because the, the, the away ties are all tough. You know, you saw it in Feyenoord. You know, it'll be tough in Madrid. You know, I've watched them recently. I've watched Lazio as well recently. Um, and they're, they're, they're up and down Lazio, but Madrid are, are a different, you know, they're a different ball game when it comes to the quality they've got. And obviously, you know, the fact that their home support is so vociferous for them. That'll be a tough ask going there. But the home game, the Celtic Park, 
you know, the club's done it so many times in the past. Who, who knows how it's going to be? You know, Celtic will need to be at their best in any of the home ties because it's a tough group. You know, people were saying at the start, oh, it's maybe one of the better groups. I always thought you're playing against three good quality teams. Now, can you win the home games? Of course you can. Can you get results at home? Of course. Away from home is going to be difficult. So for me, it's the home ties that um, give us a chance in the group stage to get to that top two position or at worst case, you know, the top three position, but ideally top two. Yeah, I mean, you mentioned, Roy, yourself about some of those games that you were involved in as a player. And I just wanted to touch upon that again on those European nights and to get some of your memories of some of those standout moments. You mentioned Real Madrid. I imagine that's up there, but is there anything else for you? It's a different, you know, because it wasn't the league format, it was home and away games. And it was all about producing your form at home to give you a chance away. But, you know, we fell short in a couple of those big matches, games at Celtic. You know, we beat Madrid there, we beat Juventus there. You know, you mentioned the Sport and Lisbon game, but we did qualify to go through. Um, obviously, going away from home then, we, we suffered, you know, and we lost out in the ties. But the games at Celtic Park, those massive European nights, um, were, were terrific and really what we, you know, what every player wanted to, to be part of. You know, and I was fortunate enough to be part of a lot of them. Just as I said before, I never get by the quarter final stage. That was the best we did. But there was a couple of occasions where, you know, had circumstances gone in our gone our way, we might have done a bit, you know, might have gone a bit further, and that would have been nice, you know, you know. But we're all we're all in in the sort of shadow of the of the lions, you know, and what they achieved, and that was that special um, occasion, that special team, um, and everyone was, you know, we're, we're all trying to do a similar sense, you know, in, in Europe. The ball games changed completely, obviously. Now it's such a such a massive gulf, but you know. For the club's point of view, it's just great to be in the competition. It's great to be in the league format for real. They deserve to be there. Um, And, you know, let's just see over the course of these games how we can do this season. And hopefully if we get some big results at home, then we'll have a chance. Yeah. Um, Roy, I can't have you on the podcast without just talking a little bit more generally about your Celtic career because as outlined at the start and as everybody knows they don't really need a reminder anyway you sit amongst the the legends of this football club and I was just doing a little bit more research when I knew I was going to be interviewing you today and one thing that struck me which I didn't know about yourself and maybe this is my fault that you made your debut just at 16 in 1975 in such an incredible team I've got some of the, the names in front of me with Kenny Dalgleish Dixie Deans Bobby Lennox Harry Hood just take me back to what it was like for yourself coming into that team that at the time Jock's team was manager but he was away at, at that moment in time um, receiving treatment so what was it like for you coming in at such a young age into that type of group and environment it was, it was a bit surreal it was a bit of, I mean obviously we get more publicity now because of the social media and different things I mean I was still at school so I was actually basically I never saw the team until um, the Saturday I trained two nights a week myself well I say myself I trained with the other um, part timers or sort of S forms at that time and I went to the reserve team to start with and then during that season you say 16 I made my debut in the League Cup I then turned 17 in November and then came into the team for real in the league in the February. So that was a 75, 76 season. But again, you know, you're, you mentioned, you know, Doug Leish, McGray and Lennox, you know, Dixie Deans, George McCluskey, Tommy Burns and I came through together. Tommy's a couple of years older at that time. George was a little bit older. But we all we came through that, that, that together. They were at the club. But I was, you know, I would, I would then go back into the school on the Monday morning. I was doing my hires uh, at that time. So... I, I was, you know, I played about 20 odd games. I, I remember going in a European tie, actually, we played Saturday Rings Week out, got a result at Celtic Park, but over there, and they had to take, and they had to adopt me because I was under 18 or something and report, you know, that was obviously the old Eastern Bloc countries, East Germany. So, I mean, look, when I look back now, it was it, it was a bit of a surreal moment. And at the end of that season, uh, Jockstein pulled me aside and said, look, you know, you, you can't do, you can't go part time and be the level you want to be at. So, yeah, my mind was made up by that time, Ryan. I played 20 odd games, you know, in the first team. I was a regular. He, he then moved me from centre back into central midfield. And Pat Stanton came into the club then and we won the double that following season. Uh, just failed in winning the treble by Aberdeen beaters in the final of the League Cup. So that was a 76 77. Great memories, you know. And as I said, from then on, I just I played virtually every game, you know. And I was fortunate enough to play with some great players. And over the years, um, you know, I was made captain at an early age as well, uh, on and off, depending on who was fit and who wasn't fit. Um, so, 
you know, obviously the, the manager saw plenty in me to to get me into the team. The, the thing about making your playing for Celtic is sometimes it's not so hard. It's the easier part is to make your debut. The harder part is to stay in the team. You know, to stay in there season in and season out. And I was fortunate enough. I played with so many great players and fortunate enough that I was able to do that and, and play a big part in many successes over the years. Um, but yeah, it, it's nice to look back and think, well, I remember getting the pictures from the chemistry class and running out of school with the, with the school books and all that kind of stuff. It, you, you can't, it's hard to imagine it now, isn't it? It's hard to imagine that happening now. Um, but it didn't, it didn't in my day. So, And I travelled with, with the great Bobby Lennox for many years, him and I shared the, the the car. He was I was a Dross and he was Saul Coach. And that was a great learning curve and experience for me as well, you know, because you know what he had achieved in the game and he was a great mentor to me in those early days as well, keeping me right in what it means to be Celtic and what it takes to achieve, you know, greatness within the club, you know. Uh, absolutely tremendous. And I'm, I mean, for myself, I'm, you grow up as a Celtic fan, as all Celtic fans do, as someone a little bit younger, that you grow up in the stories of the Lions, of people like yourself, of Jock Steens. And just to read off those names, the, the history that is in those teams is just absolutely phenomenal. And you were there, obviously, just at the, the last part of Jock Steens' era as Celtic manager. But I'm always interested to know if there's any Jock Steens stories that you have because he's such an iconic and legendary figure. I mean, but Jock, Jock was such a, a dynamic character. You know, he 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 filled the room. You know, he was a boss. He was the out the out and out boss. You know, no matter what he said, what he done, um, but he just had an aura about him that he, there was so much respect there for what he'd achieved. And you know, it was it was his way of the highway. At the end of the day, you know, he was he was a boss. He was in charge. But for me, you know, this is simple. You know, he knew how to build a team. You know, he moved me from being a centre, a young centre back. I mean, I played both positions for Celtic so many times, but he moved me into the central midfield at that age of 17 because he saw qualities that I could do that. And then he gave me my debut for Scotland as well when I was, you know, when I was 20. So, you know, I've got a lot to thank Jockstein for, you know, as far as my career is concerned. I mean, he was he gave me my, Celtic, my debut for Celtic, him and Sean Fallon, he gave me the debut for Scotland, played a lot of times. Um, but he, you know, he was just a, such a, iconic, you know, sort of figure that had total respect from everybody. And his great secret for me, as all the great managers are, was his ability to build a team, you know, and he built so many teams at Celtic, you know, and just by moving players into certain positions, seeing what players could do, recognising the strengths and weaknesses and being very, very simple in his, um, in his tactical awareness of the game. Put a lot of onus on to you as the individual to play well, um, but ultimately it was there to be the guiding, the guiding st- sort of light, no matter if he needed it. And, you know, it, it proved that over the years. And then, you know, after that, I can't go without mentioning Billy McNeil and Davy Hay, who were my managers there as well. Again, fantastic Celtic legends, really. Um, I was so fortunate enough to play for, I played for Billy twice, obviously, when he came back for the centenary year, and then Davy on the Atletico game that we spoke about and then going on to win the league that year. Um, I mean, we won the cup the year before. My Frank McGarvey scored the winner, um, and at at Hamden that year in '85, and then went into the Atletico game we spoke about. But then at the end of that season, you know that that team won the league. You know, coming from nowhere to to Pip Hearts in the last day of the season, another famous game. So I was fortunate enough to play with many great managers. Ryan Big Jock was one of them. Billy Davy, you know, I've got great memories with them all. I was very fortunate. Yeah, and I think as you mentioned there about that. 86 season and Love Street. I mean, I love off the stories of my dad being there and telling me everything about that day. I think he can tell me everything from the moment he woke up until he maybe had too much to drink and then his memory started to fade out after. But you love you love off those stories. And then, you know, two years after that, the centenary as well, going into to 88. I mean, it must have just been such an incredible time for you being there as a Celtic player and captain. Yeah, it was. I mean, that, you know, those are, those are the things... You know, the thing about Celtic is, you know, every year is a challenge. So, you know, you could, you know, you win whatever you win the year before, but come the following season, you start again. And, and that's the way it was at Celtic. No matter who, who was a manager, that was the expectation. The centenary year was special because it, was, it meant so much to the club and the fans. And that, that gave us that little edge that year for sure. I mean, the fans were absolutely unbelievable that year. There was a, there was a real bond between the players, the club and the fans that year, I felt. You know, like no other year that I could remember if players were doing all, you know, every every week we went to functions with the fans, 
whether it's charity functions, hospital visits, supporters functions, you know, it was very much a part that year. And, and it, it showed against against a real top Rangers side, remember, you know, the, you know they, they'd invested heavily in their side. Um, so it was a terrific season. And, and again, Billy came back and, and brought in one or two players that, that bolstered the squad. Um, and we ended up winning the double, and right, and deservedly so. You know, we, we played so well that year. Yeah, Roy, one of my earliest memories of, of a Celtic fan is I think when my dad was trying to force me to, to become a, a Celtic fan when I was very wee, I used to have this DVD and it was about Celtic's greatest moments. And I used to take it everywhere. I had a wee portable DVD player. And one of the games that was on that DVD was a 1989 Scottish Cup final. And as much as I reeled off so much of your appearances and goals and medals and everything, my first memory and my first ever recollection of you is for two moments. It's for the throw-in and for that free kick which you put into the stand in that cup final as well, which is strange for all the amazing moments you've had. That's two of your most memorable moments. <laughs> well, yeah, but you put that down to, I mean, I suppose winning, you know, end of the day, you know, I was I was brought up in, in winning traditions at Celtic, you know, and, and when you come to Celtic as a player or coach or whatever it is, whatever capacity, you have to be part of that winning mentality. And, you know, and, and on that, you know, there's been so many occasions, but on that day, when you bring it up, yeah, the throw in, when the ball goes out of play, my first reaction is take any advantage you can. So I picked it up, throw the ball, it's up to, it's up to the referee to make that decision. He allowed us to play on, we scored. Joe pops up and scores a great the great winner. And then at the end of the game, I know I know it's the last minute. It's old Hamden. There's no multi-ball system. <laughs> so for me, it was a case of right, either take this shot, lose it, put it into the box, lose it, and they have another attack. Or I put it as far up the Celtic end and amongst all our all our supporters. It took about five minutes to for the ball to come back. By the time they take the the, the goal kick, it's time up. But that, that's that, that's just maybe that little winning mentality, Ryan, that, you know, you do anything you can to win the game, you know, and, and those little fine fine elements in the game can make a difference, you know. You wouldn't so much get away with it now. Well, two reasons. But those, those two instances, for example, probably VAR would have pulled me back <laughs> on the on the throw-in, <laughs> possibly. Albeit there's a lot of other occasions that I think VAR would have helped us that we didn't get many yeah. times ourselves over the years. I played <laughs> many games where we thought some decisions were a bit dodgy. And then the the new stadiums now and the ball boys and the multi ball you, you you're not got away with kicking the ball a hundred yards behind the goals and two minutes for it to come back you know so <laughs> so yeah um, different it's a different game now but no good good also good memories but the main thing for us that day was to to win the cup yeah. and obviously Joe scored the goal and it was another great occasion to stay, we stopped Rangers again that you know that that juggernaut of Rangers at that time spending the money they spent. You know, it was a case of, you know, we had to win that final that year. Um, and we deservedly won the final. I think, you know, it wasn't a great final, but we did enough to win the game. Yeah, yeah, that's what kept you at the top at Celtic for all that time, that winning mentality just to to stay at that that football club and to perform at that level. Uh, Roy, I mean, there's so many moments we've not touched upon. There's 79, there's more goals and, and derbies. There's everything I think we would need a full series of podcasts to go through them all. So I think we'll leave it there for now, Roy. Uh, thank you so much for your time. Um, hopefully we'll see you soon at Celtic Park and yeah, hopefully Celtic can get a result in this Atletico Madrid game. But thank you so much for joining us. No problem, Ryan. Delighted. Yes, welcome back to the official Celtic FC podcast. I hope you enjoyed that interview with Roy Aitken. Uh, just before we get into the chat, um, what we have here is, for those that are watching, um, we have two copies of the brand new EAFC 24 to give away. So what we're going to do is we want to give them away to you guys for subscribing and following and downloading the podcast so if you want to have a chance of winning what we're asking is if you download subscribe follow to the podcast take a screenshot on your phone on your laptop whatever it may be and if you email us at celticview at celticfc.co.uk with that screenshot then you'll enter the chance to win a copy of eafc 24 for whatever console that you have and We'll announce the winner on next Tuesday's podcast. So if you want to have a chance to win that, then then get involved. Right, guys, let's get into it. Um, we heard from Roy Aitken there. Paul, uh, 
a player that you would have grown up watching? Have you got any favourite memories of, of Roy? Well, do you know, I was trying to work out when I would have first seen him playing. I mean, it would have been round about 1976 when he broke into the team. I can't remember the exact game. So, yeah, you're right. I think most of my memories growing up, Roy was, was part of that, that team, um, a part of Celtic, he, you know. He is a legend. I mean, he's just a, a great player. He was one of these guys, I think, when he came into the team, even though he was just a teenager, he was just, his physique, his character, he was just a man, I mean, right away, and he just fitted in perfectly. Probably a better footballer sometimes than I think people gave him credit for because he was very competitive, very physical, but I think a, a really good footballer um, and an absolute leader for for us. Um, I mean, there's the ones that come to mind just off the top of my head, remember he scored a couple of goals at Ibrox, and there's the famous footage of... Um, I think we were losing 2-1 and it was the last minute and I think the, the Rangers fans either had their scarves raised mm. and then Roy scores and then suddenly it was like <laughs> a cue, all the, all the scarves disappear, which was great. And again, it was it was always a big game player. Um, the 1985 Cup final, when we were losing 2-1 to the D United, he kind of basically took the game and the team by the scruff of the neck, dragged us forward um, and we won 2 1. It was his cross that Frank McGarvey headed home for the winner. And then I also love the, the one at the 1989 Cup yeah. final. Yeah. With the, one of the best free kicks I've ever, ever seen. <laughs> we were winning 1 0 in the last minute, and it's down the corner flag. And he just leathered the ball into the Celtic end just yeah. to, to eat up time. And the days before, the, the, the multi ball games, of course. <laughs> I know it's funny because I mentioned that to Roy in the interview that obviously being younger, didn't have a chance to grow up and watch him. And he had so many memories from all these games, the goals that he scored, the trophies that he's won. But my first memories of him are from seeing those videos of that 1989 yeah. Scottish Cup final and his free kick and also for his, his throw in as well that he cheekily takes and we go up the other end and <laughs> score yeah. from. Um, but have you ever had a chance to meet Roy? I've met Roy a couple of times um, down in the boardroom, just when I've been working on match days or whatever uh, through the years. But exactly, what, exactly what Paul was touching on there. Just the stature mm -hmm. of the man, even still, t you know, at this point in time, like he still carries himself. You can tell that this is a Celtic captain. You know, you can tell this is a leader that's won trophies with with the club. But I always think as well with with guys like that, especially from that era, despite the fact that they've won all of these honours and had all these wonderful moments, there's a real sort of humble quality to them as well, where there's not an arrogance. Okay, there's there's maybe a swagger in terms of the the sort of weight of what they've achieved. They carry it around with them, but there's no arrogance or anything like that. But I, I found them to be totally charming. But um, yeah, I'm the same as you. You know, looking back at the footage, but you also see what it meant to him in the centenary season as well, winning the cup, winning the league. You can't fake those emotions. You know, it, it, it genuinely meant a lot to him, and I'm sure it's still something that he's incredibly proud of. Yeah, definitely, and. Paul, the reason we had Roy Aitken on to look ahead to this Atletico Madrid match is because facing him on Wednesday night in the Champions League, it's not the first time we've faced him. We've got a bit of history with Atletico. Um, first games in 1974, then that match in 1985, which Roy Aitken played in, and more recently we did play him again in, in 2011. Um, you have memories of growing up and watching those games, probably more infamous than famous. Yeah, I mean, that, that game in 1974, it's probably... My dad started taking me to games in 1972, so I had been to a, a few games. So I remember, like, moments and just wee fragments of memories. That game is the first game where I, I, I remember everything about it because it was most one of the most shocking things I'd ever seen. And, and still, to this day, one of the most shocking things I've ever seen on a football pitch. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, they get three players sent off, seven booked. The, the, it was an absolute disgrace and they should have been thrown out. And, I mean, the Celtic fans, to their credit that night, kept a, a cool because there was a lot of anger because of what the injustice of what they'd seen. And what I, I also remember, um, it was a midweek game and obviously I was only like, was seven at the time and came, came home and normally just be, go straight to bed. But it was so shocking. I was allowed to stay up and watch the highlights. And even though it was a school night, mm -hmm. because we, me and my dad were trying to tell my mum what had happened, but you couldn't explain. And even when you see the footage and and, and what happened, it was extraordinary. Um, and obviously we lost the, the second leg. What is most extraordinary, and, and you and I were talking about this this morning, Ryan, is that Atletico Madrid are wearing their kit on Wednesday as a kind of tribute to that game. 
in that back in 1974. <laughs> so they're going to be wearing an all red top, blue shorts, and I think it was blue socks. I think that is, uh, you know, talk about not reading the room properly. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know if they're putting that on thinking that we're going to unite with them and have this celebration <laughs> for 1974 when we lose a European Cup semi-final yeah. um so that'll be that'll be interesting i mean it's <laughs> i mean the, the thing obviously that was a european cup semi-final for us and we were so close and even in the return leg it was two goals in the last 13 minutes or so but they were seconds away from actually winning i think Bayern munich equalized in the last minute of extra time and then won the replay 4-0 so the kind of justice was done at the end mm. so i've always you know I, I, they've never been one of my favorite teams for that you know that moment and and primary school was implanted in my head <laughs> forever and uh, I should let it go all these years later but I don't <laughs> know if I can. We're an extraordinary support though right because you and I you know we're, we're going to have to just trust stories and video footage yeah. for this but I'm feeling that going into this game as well I'm like nah these are no friends of ours <laughs> on the pitch. You See know, to be fair I mean we were, never, we were nowhere near it. It's, it's one of those things that, it, that obviously there's a lot of years have passed since then we've played them a couple of times since then and, and there's not really any sort of relationship between the yeah. two clubs or anything. It's just when you look back, and I think in the last couple of times we've met them, we've not really looked back to that game because it is, mm-hmm. I mean, it's barely a football game. Yeah, That's why I think it's extraordinary that <laughs> Atletico Madrid have actually decided that they're going to celebrate the fact yeah. that Bring they, it up. they came here and, and basically assaulted us for 90 yeah. minutes. What a way to stoke the fires. Um, <laughs> looking ahead to this match then on Wednesday night. Uh, Matt, you've been having a little look, haven't you, for Celtic against teams yeah. in Spain and yeah. Europe. I mean, it's not the best of readings, is it, for us? Uh, so far? I've got to be honest, like, the stats book is <laughs> going to creak open here because <laughs> these numbers are, are not good. Like you just touched on there, we've obviously faced Atletico Madrid uh, three times prior to this game, so we've, we've, we've played six matches against yeah. them. It's... Well, there's no other way of putting it. You know, we're we're well behind on the aggregate score. It's currently eight to the Atletico on aggregate. Sure, we'll, I'm sure we'll catch it up on Wednesday. Uh, we've never beaten them. Uh, the best we've managed is uh, a couple of draws against them. But uh, you know, overall, in terms of Celtic versus Spanish opposition, that sort of trend continues. We don't have a great record against Spanish opposition in Europe. Um, and I'll, I'll just dig right into this here. So, in terms of Celtic versus Spain. At Celtic Park, we've won, uh, in terms of the score, sorry, it's 21-24 in Spain's favour just now. And overall, it's 33-74 in Spain's right, okay. favour. That's including <laughs> away games um, as well. So, you know, usually at this point, domestically, when we're doing the stats, I'll say, so the numbers are looking good for <laughs> us. You know, we should be confident going into this. We should be confident because it's Celtic Park in Europe and... I know recently maybe this hasn't been as true as it was uh, previously in terms of anything can happen on a European night, but we still have that element within within the four walls of this stadium, especially if they're turning up wearing a tribute kit to a match, which is pretty much a shame game for them. Um, but in terms of Celtic versus Spain, we've got a, a historic connection as well, I guess, here, and it's something that obviously we like to touch on a wee bit of the history on the podcast, our first competitive appearance in Europe came against Spanish opposition in 1962. We came up against Valencia in the Fair Cities Cup, which was kind of like the precursor to the UEFA Cup, which is now obviously the Europa League. <laughs> Again, though, we lost 6-4 on aggregate, so the numbers even back then, uh, you know, they weren't they weren't great for us. But Valencia actually went on to win that tournament that year. They beat Dunfermline and Hibs on their way to that final. And in actual fact, somewhere in this stadium, we have the gift on display from that match against Valencia in the Fair Cities Cup. But yeah, overall, the numbers not looking no. great for Celtic. And uh, I'm sure you're going to give fellas in on how Atletico are faring coming into this game. Because we, we've actually, in the match programme for Wednesday, there's obviously an interview with Roy Aitken, because he talks about the, the 85 game where it was played mm-hmm. behind closed doors here. But we also went back into our, our yeah. archives and had an old interview with Bobby Carroll, yeah. who played... And also scored their first ever European goal as well in the program, which was fascinating. Obviously, he's passed he's passed away now, but it was fascinating just to get his memories of you know the start of our European journey. It's incredible to think. I mean, because that's our first foreign into Euro- European competition. Obviously, we lose six four uh, on aggregate over those two matches. Um, but it's it's crazy to think five years on from that game after being mm. knocked out in round one of the the Fair Cities Cup. 
that would go on and be the champions of Europe. It's just incredible the sort of turnaround and how quick it was in that era. But um, yeah, I'm sure we'll focus on that on another podcast in terms of our our wonderful season in 66-67. Yeah, we'll look a little bit more closely at Atletico Madrid in a moment. But I think probably the, the first thing to touch upon going into this game is that we had to look at the match on Sunday because we're going into the game mm. in very good form domestically. We seem yep. to be getting better and better with each week. On the European front, we're still to pick up a point. Obviously, the heartache of that match against Lazio here at Celtic Park. But, Paul, if we're to take the confidence from Sunday, then I mean, it's only going to do the players and the team the world of good, isn't it? Absolutely. I mean, I think they'll take confidence from the Lazio game as well, mm, even though, yeah. there, as you say, there was a heartache at the end because I think the performance merited something. But I think domestically, we've looked really impressive. When you look at the first quarter of, of our fixtures, it's been a really hard run of games. If you could have picked all the away grounds, the toughest away grounds to go to, we've gone to them all. And so far, you know, up until we, we go to Easter Road at the weekend, we've passed these tests mm. with flying colours. I thought the performance, because it's always interesting when you hear people after the game, sometimes it, you can always tell if it's Celtic fans analysing the game because they'll either praise us or maybe they'll say, well, hearts weren't very good. Mm-hmm. The reason we are, it wasn't so much hearts weren't very good, they couldn't get the ball. Yeah. We were just exceptional um, from the world goal, from Matt O'Reilly's goal, which has already got to be up there for one of the, yeah. the candidates for goal of the season. That was just unbelievable. But yeah, it's, it was a great performance. So obviously the manager and the players know it's a, it's a massive step up because you're playing a really top, top team. But at the same time, you want to go in full of confidence. So... You know, playing at home, sixty thousand fans. You know, everybody's playing well, and we just have to go for it. Mm. I feel like this podcast is becoming a bit of a Matt O'Reilly loving as yeah. well at the moment because every time we sit down to do this, yeah. it's off the back of another I want, amazing I want to, performance. I want to start a petition that this becomes simply a Matt O'Reilly fan <laughs> podcast at this point because he is a sensational player having a sensational season. Like you say, that goal was a, a thing of. I mean, I know that. There are some people commenting about how you know the goals were sloppy from Hart's point of view. Oh, that was the manager, yeah. Come on now. That <laughs> yeah. was an absolutely fantastic goal. A wonderfully worked finish I, as well. I always think sometimes, you, even if you are the opposition manager, sometimes you just have to hold your hand up and say, there was nothing we could do about that yeah. because the ball from Palmer was just yeah perfect. But how many players can take that ball on the run the way he did and volley it beyond the keeper. Well, I've, I've seen you at five sides, so, you know, you and Matt <laughs> O'Reilly, maybe. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> You're very welcome. Uh, no, it was brilliant. What uh, a wonderful, wonderful result. I was wondering, though, you know, because obviously the whole thing about the sort of small away section and stuff, I was wondering if maybe Halloween has come early in Gorgie this year and a couple of thousand of them turned up to the game yesterday dressed as maroon seats, <laughs> which was uh, interesting to see. But it's always obviously good to go up there and get a result. Um, and what confidence to go in to the to, to this to this match on Wednesday night. We, you know, we were absolutely flying, like you see, out of the traps at the start of the match and then at the start of the second half as well. We were, we were, we were talking about the game yesterday. I was working in here during the match and we're saying, if we can get an early goal here in the second half, you know, we could be onto something here. We could score a good few. Fifteen seconds later, we get the penalty. I know we don't no. score it, obviously, but it just shows the intent. We, we, we were flying yesterday, and hopefully, we can carry that into any Wednesday yeah. night. Ah, there was quite a spooky, eerie feel at time yeah, so on, on Sunday. Was it was probably the quietest I've heard in a, a long time, and that's all be- to credit of, of our team because we do just keep getting better and better. So, looking at this match on Wednesday, look, we know it's going to be really tough against Atletico Madrid. Just looking at some of the stats. At the moment for them this season, they are three points off the top of La Liga, but they've played one game less than all of the other teams. They've only lost one game in all competitions so far. They're just in the back of a 3-0 victory over Celta Vigo at the weekend where Antoine Griezmann scored a hat-trick. Um, and I think he's now eight or nine goals off from becoming Atletico's all-time top goal scorer. <laughs> all good. So, <laughs> all good. Uh, yeah, so he's, he's in good form. Uh, they're in good form. They've got four points so far in the Champions League group stage they beat Feyenoord 3-2 in the last match the first game probably most memorable for the stoppage time equaliser from Providel the, mm. the Lazio goalkeeper so it's it's going to be tough we, we know that what do we what do we expect from this what do we want to see from Celtic going into this one because from our point of view in the opening two games so far and particularly the last one the performance has been good hasn't mm-hmm. it Paul? Yeah, I mean, I think they'll, they'll be looking for more of the same from the Lazio game. I mean, we, there was elements in the final game where it was really encouraging, 
but when you get down to 10 and then 9 men, it's so difficult. I thought the Lazio game, we at least deserved a point. So I think we have to play, and I think I'm sure the manager will, will want them to try and play our game, but at the same time, acknowledging the fact that there'll be periods in the game where we're not going to have the ball, because this is a team full of World Cup winners. <laughs> I mean, the last two World Cups, you know, France and Argentina, these guys are in that team. They, they, they will have aspirations to go deep in this tournament. So they'll have the ball, but we have to just, when we don't have the ball, work really hard and, and defend and try and deny them space and time. But again, similar to the to Lazio game, if we get chances, maybe few and far between, we need to, to take them. Mm-hmm. Yeah. What you get, Matt, with Atletico Madrid, a lot of time when people talk about Spanish football and they talk about the nice passing and the tiki taka. Mm-hmm. Atletico have that edge though, don't they, under yeah. Diego Simeone? No, totally. And, and, and you know that that if they need to go there, then they will. They'll have that physical element, that kind of, you know, that the, the, they'll take it into that kind of zone if they need to. But like Paul said, I think that's the. I think the key word is the work. That we're, it's going to be a, a a night where legs are going to have to burn, lungs are going to have to burn. We're going to be chasing it for for a while. But I've got every belief because, you know, we've seen what we can do. We know we know we're a good team. We're a good side. We can move the ball well. We can keep the ball. You know, most games in this in this country and in this in this league, that's what we do. We keep the ball and we move it, so we're well used to it. So when we get it, it's about not being wasteful and trying to carve opportunities. I, I do sometimes think that we don't get enough really solid chances in front of goal, and and I think that's been the last two games in the group stage so far that we've not had a, a lot of great chances. So when we when we get a chance, we're going to have to make sure it, it hits the back of the net mm-hmm. and to give ourselves a chance because we know that that when the quality that Atletico Madrid are going to bring. Well, also, if you it. if you look at their two games, the, you know the the first game Lazio for for periods of the game were the stronger side and obviously, as you say, there was that drama of the goalkeeper scoring late on, but they more matched Atletico and it was a three two game mm-hmm. against Feyenoord and again there was periods in the, you know when we played against Feyenoord when we were more than held our own so. I can see us scoring, but again, it's known that the other team are going to create chances mm-hmm. and how we deal with that. But you know, we touched on it already. We we have to go in full of confidence. You know, when the way the team's playing and the way individuals are playing just now, and they want to, they want to challenge themselves against Griezmann. I mean, you, you you have to be a good player if you're going to have a haircut. Yeah. The way he is, <laughs> and fair play to him. He is top yeah. top draw for a man with with pink hair on occasion. Yeah. He, he 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 walks the walk as well as talks the talk. Yeah. But these are the nights, from a fan's point of view, I think from a player's point of view, I spoke to Matt O'Reilly after the match at Tyne Castle and you asked him about the game, and from their point of view, it's like, we just treat it as any other game. And you have to have that attitude probably as a player. But we don't have to have that attitude as a fan. Yeah. And these are the nights when a massive team like Atletico come into town, they've been in the Champions League finals in 2014 and 2016, the passion that they're going to have in the park, the passion that we're going to have in the park, sometimes these can be the occasions that, yes, we've not picked up a point yet, but we could just upset everybody and upset the whole of Europe and get something in this match. It would be such a massive result. And like you say, it would be, it probably okay, it would be an upset. You know, people would, we, we are not going to be the favourites going into this match. But this is Celtic Park and it's Celtic and it's a European night. And so you know because you've seen it so many times through the years that, Things like that can happen. Who, who would have expected us to beat, you know, Barca that night, for example? But but we did. They came here and and, and we failed them. That it could be this. It, we could do it again on Wednesday night. But it's all that. It's all the stuff we've been talking about. Def, you know, we need to defend well, prevent them from getting chances, and then take our chances. That's to me. That is the big thing. That's as a fan going to the game Wednesday night. That is what I am going to be looking and hoping for. That we create a couple of good chances. And that we take them, because I think if we do that, that's we're in with a real shout. You know, we could be in with a real shout of a of a, of one of their famous European nights, which which would be nice. It'd mm-hmm. be nice to have a, a one a famous result again. You know, it feels uh, like a while since we've had it. And I think it would be fitting uh, with Atletico Madrid wearing that tribute shirt yeah. if we can <laughs> beat them. Yeah, <Aye>, absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> I know it's almost like they're they've got the kind of the bull fighting and putting the red on That's for it and we're yeah. just going to go flying through them. Eh? Absolutely. Um, no, hopefully hopefully we can, as you said, get a big result because, you know, we sit here and talk about our memories of European nights. Um, Paul, you were talking about 1974, you know, but you've, you've watched so many amazing European nights here at Celtic Park. We've been privileged to watch yeah. some 
of those as well. But you know, there'll be a generation of supporters now that are wanting to experience their own massive European nights, and hopefully, this could be the type of occasion where everything just pulls together, yeah. us as fans and as players, and we get a massive result. I mean, I think you, you saw it last season with Real Madrid, and you'll see it again on Wednesday night. To your point, Matt, it's, I think regardless of who we play, I think everybody on a European night at Celtic Park turns up with that optimism and and real belief that we can do it because we have seen it so many times over the years. And obviously, regardless of who you're playing, and you know, we know the players that we've got just now can compete at this level. We've seen it already. Mm. And just, you know, some things just need to click into place, but there's no reason why... We, we can't get a result. Yeah, definitely. Uh, we'll have a, a proper review and preview to Saturday's match against Hibs on our next podcast, which will come out on Friday in all your podcast channels. So join us again for that and yeah. we'll, we'll have a, a proper look back onto it. Um, but also before the first team's game on Wednesday night, the B team are also going to be in action in the UEFA Youth League, also against Atletico Madrid at home. They're on the back of a one-each draw against Lazio in their last UEFA Youth League match. Atletico Madrid have won one game. They've also lost one game in the Youth League as well. Again, it's hard for us to sit here and discuss in terms of the ins and outs of, of what this match could entail yeah. because we don't watch the under-19s of Atletico Madrid yeah. uh, every week. But as we kind of always touch upon, Matt, this is a really important challenge for the B team in terms of their development to go up against some of Europe's best. Absolutely, and am I right in saying that they got a bit of a poor result in their just there at the weekend? Also, I think the B team. I think they. I think they. I think they yeah, they lost beat, at the weekend. Beat, yeah, uh, two one. I think my hearts potentially. So yeah, Friday night. Um, yeah. they'll be looking even just on on a personal level for each of those players in the B team to bounce back from that because that will be a disappointment for them. But it's the same thing, you know, as like we're just saying there. These, the top players, our players, you you want to test yourself against the best players in the world. Well, at this level, at the B team level, this is the equivalent. You know, these are the best players in the world at that age group and at that level. So this is your chance then to go out and make a statement, make a point, show that you are worthy of being considered at that level as well. So it'll be an exciting one for them, and of course they got a great, uh, not a great, a good result against Lazio in the draw. We sat and watched that ge- the, mm-hmm. the, la- the the last few minutes of that game. It was a penalty, wasn't it? Yeah, right, right in the right in injury time right. against the cars. That's it's right, a right stunning the penalty. It was a brilliant penalty, yeah. by the way. Um, so hopefully something similar for them midweek. Uh, but like I say, the team will they be looking to bounce back anyway because they've they're coming off the back of a disappointing result against Hearts uh, at the weekend there. Yeah, definitely. And if you get a chance to head down to to that game, um, then then do so because yeah. it'll be on uh, in the afternoon before the first team match um, down at Lesser Hamden or what, I don't know what the official title now is it's that the stadium. City Stadium the City but Stadium yeah it's Lesser Hamden it's r- right beside if you head for Hamden you'll find it <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, just before we finish up uh, Matt I know you wanted to discuss Bobby Charlton yes. who over the weekend uh, sadly passed at the age of 86 I believe um, someone um, who's an absolute legend of, yeah. of football of Manchester United um, won everything in the game but there's a reason that we're bringing Bobby Charlton up on the, the official Celtic FC podcast. That's right, absolutely. So, I mean, we just thought it'd be a, f- a, a nice touch to pay tribute to a wonderful player and by all accounts, a, a, a true gentleman of the game. Of course, Manchester United supporters are going through a sort of grieving process just now, which, as you would expect, with Bobby Charlton being such a, a legend of their football club, he made 750 appearances for Manchester United and scored 249 goals. Utterly sensational. For many people, he's considered to be England's greatest ever player. He's certainly in the argument as being one of England's greatest ever players, and and you know you can see why. So of course, Bobby Charlton's story is quite remarkable. He survived the Munich mm. air disaster. Eight of his teammates passed away. Of course, that team, the Busby Babes. Um, was such a renowned team at that point in time. I always wonder if that terrible tragedy hadn't happened, that team may well have gone on to win the European Cup. So they would have become the first football club from the UK, the first club from the north of Europe to, to lift the trophy. Of course, as it happened, that, that terrible incident took place and it wasn't until 1968 that Manchester United lifted the lifted the trophy with Bobby Charlton 
still in the team. So he won three league titles as a player, won FA Cup, won European Cup, won World Cup, and he won the Ballon d'Or as mm. well. Um, but the reason I wanted to, to mention him was because he played for Celtic. He made a, <laughs> he made an appearance for Celtic in 1974. He pulled on the hoops for Ron Yates' testimonial. Um, so basically, reading about this, the story that, that I've read a few times there is that Bobby Charlton needed to get fit because he was going to take over as player manager of Preston North End. So Ron Yates' testimony came up, Celtic versus Liverpool at Anfield in 1974, and uh, Jock Steen allowed Bobby Charlton to, to play for Celtic that day to sort of help build his fitness. And in classic Bobby Charlton style, he scored. He scored for Celtic. He scored the opener, actually. And it was a classic strike from him, outside the box, uh, straight into the back of the net. And we won 4-1 four, four on, on that occasion. Like you say, he passed away at the weekend, Bobby Charlton, aged 86. So I'm sure the thoughts of everybody at the football club and all the supporters are with the Charlton family and all the supporters of Manchester United who will be mourning his passing. I was actually talking to my, my dad about this at the weekend because he grew up in that era where he would have... You know, from the Busby Babes era onwards, and I think it was about a year or two before the the Munich Air disaster that Celtic had played Manchester United. I think it was a charity game, and my dad remembered, you know, being at the game and watching all these young players, Bobby Charlton, Duncan Edwards, and all these mm. players that were you know, on the verge of greatness. Um, so I was talking to him about that, and obviously, for that age, he was only eighteen at the time, and that would have had a profound effect on him as all football fans yeah. because this was like a, a great team and, and that tragedy. So for him, as you said, Matt, that his story is extraordinary to 10 years later s score two goals in the European final to yeah. bring the, the cup to, yeah. you know, greatness admires greatness. And I, I think you can see the way, I think the biggest thing, like you, you touched on it earlier on about Roy Aitken, all the, the best players are always the most humble as well, yeah. which I always find is e extraordinary, but so humbling in itself. Yeah, you, you see the footage when he, receives his Lifetime Achievement Award, um, which his brother Jack yeah, presents yeah. to him. It's, absolutely, it's, a, it's a beautiful moment, actually, um, shared between two brothers. Jack Charlton sort of comes on stage and said he's always been my younger brother and he's the best player I've ever seen. But Bobby Charlton, like you say, that humble attitude, you know, stands with that award, that Lifetime Achievement Award, having won everything in the game. You know, the, the, he, won it, he won it all. And pretty much his words were... That was a great team that gave a lot of people a lot of joy, and if I could play a little part in that, then that makes me happy. A little part in that. I mean, <laughs> look at the things <laughs> he won. Look at all those appearances. It's an extraordinary career, and we were laughing earlier on because just to see a Celtic team line up with Bobby Charlton on it, I mean, can you imagine if he had been playing for us uh, for real? You know, we could have a whole number of European Cups I sitting know. in that cabinet down the stage. He truly was a sensational talent. He'll be, he'll be sorely missed by the football and world, mainly, of course, down at Manchester United, where he, he made his name, he made his career. So, yeah, I just thought it would, would be nice yeah. to touch on that. No, definitely, Matt. It's good to bring that up, a man that's, that's donned the, the green and white of, of Celtic. Guys, I think that'll be a good place to leave it for this official Celtic FC podcast. Hopefully, as we discussed on Wednesday night, we can have one of those famous nights once again yeah. at Celtic Park and get a victory our first one of this Champions League <laughs> campaign. But yeah, we'll be back again on Friday to look ahead to the weekend's action where the first team will be travelling through to Leith to take on Hibs and we'll, we'll review Wednesday night's game against Atletico Madrid as well. So do join us then on Friday. Make sure you like and subscribe to the podcast wherever you get your podcast channels. And also remember, if you do so, then you can have a chance of winning one of the brand new eSports FC 24 could be a hand model can it look at that yeah. fantastic <laughs> you've done that before haven't you <laughs> <laughs> um, so get send in your screenshots uh, to our email address celticview at celticfc.co.uk for a chance to get your copy of that but for now thank you very much for listening thank you guys for joining us and we will see you again on Friday hail hail